Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. I don't know why I did a beep, but hi guys. <laughs> Leave a back. message at the beep. <laughs> just Elizabeth counted down and I was just felt like I should do a beep. So hi, welcome back to the Biz Birthday Bash podcast. Um, we're so excited to chat with you guys today. So we're going to be doing like a little overview of crap fairs and in-person markets. I feel like we've gotten quite a few questions from y'all about like, I'm doing a craft show. How do I prep? What do I do? Like, what are all the things, all the tips and tricks? So we're just going to go through some of the ways that we prepared for our own craft shows in the past and just little notes that we've taken along the way. It's been a long time since I've done one, but I definitely remember some of the things about it and uh, just some things to look out for so you can have like a really successful show because they are a ton of work, a ton of work, but you can absolutely get a ton out of them. So we'll go through the ways to really maximize your time at any craft fairs or in-person events. Yay. I love it. And to go back to people asking questions like, A lot of times people come to us asking, should I do this or should I do that? One of them being craft fairs. Well, the information in this episode will help you make the right decision for you because they're not the right decision for everybody, but they are amazing and perfect for some people. So it completely depends on your business model and your goals and your objectives. So hopefully you'll be able to take away something from this that that makes you understand like, yes, that's definitely for me. I want to pursue it or no, that's not the right fit. Yeah, for sure. And like, this is almost just like, I almost said diving right in almost just like stepping right into the meat and potatoes, but not all craft fairs and markets are created equal. Like some of them you're going to do great at some of them you think you're going to do great, you do horrible. Some are just like, yeah, I made my money back. Like, it really is almost a crapshoot, but you don't know until you know, <laughs> um, because you just can't tell what it's what the vibe is going to be like, what type of audience that craft fair brings. So like, obviously, with more experience, you'll be able to understand like what type of audience works best with your product in person. So you can kind of gauge better on what kind of craft shows are worth doing. But definitely when you're just getting started, I feel like any of them, it's fine just to have some experience under your belt. You'll always walk away with something, even if it's not the monetary value you want to make, but just throwing that out there at the beginning. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And did you already mention that we've broken it down kind of into three sections? No. So that should be really helpful to you guys where you are doing things to think about before your craft fair, during your craft fair, and afterwards. So this should, with look at us, we actually have, (laughs) actually have a plan in place. It's amazing. (laughs) And the other thing, too, that I I guess we can go ahead and start talking about it, the before stuff, Cammy, because Cammy yeah. wrote a ton of good notes. But the other thing before is that it does cost money to attend some craft fairs. So that's something you have to factor in, like how much it is to have your booth there. Yeah. If you're doing any sort of – I'm using the word professional here. I'm not really sure if that's the right word, but like professional craft fair in-person market, like something that's put on like a rather large event, it is going to cost money. Um, if you're doing something like at a local school or something small, most likely not going to cost money. They're just looking for vendors to come out. But the bigger ones that are going to have good marketing in place and have good foot traffic are going to cost money. It really depends on, I think I paid $300 for a booth fee before. I paid $50 before. I think some even can cost like 1000 I don't even know. But like the one I, the most I did, I think was 300 maybe 500 300 or 500 Yeah. One of those. <laughs> yep, that sounds about right. So don't just expect to be able to show up wherever for free. Unfortunately, there is going to be something. Yeah, and some of them are, are juried as well, where you have to like submit pictures of your booth and your product so they can see if you are a good fit as well. Ah, yeah. So there's Ooh. a whole like application process that's like the before before. <laughs> before before. Yes. Of the yes. before. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, preamble so start doing research starting a research <laughs> the prologue now. the prologue yes. um to find what's in your area what's coming up because a lot of times i see makers that like are like oh crap i missed the application date for this one that's coming out would have been perfect especially like christmas ones like that is the best time to do one in my opinion so i would start looking now for like shows in like october november because people are obviously way more in the buying mindset then mm-hmm 
Completely agree. So yeah, there's definitely a little bit of forethought and additional planning that needs to go in before you reach the point of prepping and asking yourself all the things that you need to think about before you go to the craft fair. So Cammie, let's go ahead and get started with inventory. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the big question when you're prepping for the show that you've applied for and got in, woohoo, good for you. Um, so before, <laughs> this is like the big question is how much inventory do I need to bring? Like, I feel like I see this question all the time and the wor- it's the worst answer. It's my favorite answer. You guys know what it is. It depends. <laughs> we love it. Okay. Um, but with inventory, one thing that comes down to you need to think about is if you sold everything, how much would you actually be making? Like that is going to dictate a lot of how much inventory you bring because you do want to actually make a profit. So you don't want to just bring like 20 things that are all $10 each and you make $200 and your fee was $300. Like that doesn't make any sense. So think about like making profit. Odds are you're not going to sell out of everything. So think about like maybe bringing double that of how much you would actually want to make a profit for. And then The goal is basically, my goal has always been to at least 10 times the cost of the show because it's so much work. So if you're, you know, your show costs $300, you want to make like $3,000. So how much inventory do you need to bring? How much product do you need to bring to hit that number? If you're selling $5 greeting cards, that's going to be a lot of greeting cards you got to sell. So bringing in some of those higher priced um, inventory to bring up that average order value is going to really help you have a more successful show. And thinking about what items pair well together. Like for instance, I have like tea towels and mugs and cards that all have the same designs. So they're really nice, like easy upsell for me to be like, oh, you love that design? Well, it comes on a tea towel as well and getting that higher average order value. So that's going to affect inventory, thinking how things play together. And then thinking on inventory as well is how much foot traffic is going to be at the show. Typically, you're looking at like a 1% conversion of how many people attend, but that could still be a lot. Like I know I did a show and it was like 30,000 people was like the estimate for attending. And I was like, oh my gosh, a 1% conversion of that. And this is the average they would spend. That's a lot of money, but it was like less than that. And then I did a show (laughs) where I think maybe a hundred people attended and I did better than I did at the 30,000 people attending. So it's still, like I said, a total crapshoot, but that just gives you like maybe something to work with. Um, that one, one to 2% conversion of how many people attend might purchase something from you. So a couple things to keep in mind. Again, it depends, but those are the like two factors I would consider when it comes to thinking about how much inventory to bring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. So then my question is for the one who, the event that had 100 people like one to 2% of that is only one or two people. I'm assuming that that was like a much better conversion rate because it just fit your brand. Yes, that was a much better conversion rate. Yes, that was just like right on the money. It was at like this really small shop and she had like maybe like five people there. And I used to do consignment in her shop and then she had like a little mini market outside. And that was like the best show I did because... It was just like the perfect audience, the perfect crowd. Like I nailed my booth, like fit the vibe. Like it just worked really well. And the other one I did was downtown Orlando around Lake Eola, which is this huge like fall market. And I mean, it was massive. There were so many vendors. And I think a lot of people were just coming to just enjoy the day on the weekend, walk around the lake. Like they weren't shoppers. You know what I mean? They were more like cruisers. (laughs) like (laughs) Um, So that like, and that's something I didn't didn't know beforehand. But I will say even from that show, I still gained a lot of new exposure and got some people's emails. Like that's how I built my email list from the get go was that first show. But also like looking back on it, I think I would like crush it now versus then like I have way more product, but that's a whole other side story. Um, but it, it is something to keep in mind. Like sometimes the, even the bigger shows might not do as well as the smaller ones. So something to think about. Yeah, I have definitely, I was definitely thinking about that, Cammy, with the fact that you have so much inventory and a bigger variety in products now, I could see you doing really, really well yeah. <laughs> at some sort of craft fair that even if it did have a bigger group of people that are just, just looking quote unquote, it's like your stuff is too, too cute to not, or like farmer's market. Sometimes the farmer's market has like a row of art booths. I think you would do really well there. Yeah. I, I mean, I've got my like vibe figured out before I was like, I am from the mountains. So everything's going to be woodsy. And it just, I had no idea what I was doing, but now I might have my brand figured out. So mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that would definitely do better, but <laughs> yeah, but, but that's yes. a good thing for people to take away too, is that like, you don't have to 
feel 100% perfect and ready to do something like this. Like have the mentality that Cammy did, which is like, I'm going to try it and I'm going to do it regardless of how ready I am. And it's easy to look back and say, oh, I wasn't ready. Yeah. <laughs> or no, whatever. I, I but at the time, like, yeah. I mean, I was still, you know, it took me a long time to figure out my, my brand. This is a whole nother conversation, you know, but like, I mean, doing those things, I was able to get like real time feedback from people and see like what people were gravitating towards or resonating with or like what had an impact and what was just like, oh, that could be anyone. But like what really made my work my work and and getting to see people's reaction to that helped me like take one step closer to the brand that I have now and just figuring out more of who I am as an artist. So it definitely helped. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, So (laughs) your next point, which I really like, is price everything because not only does it make it easier for people to shop, but it makes you look more professional. And I completely agree. Yeah. You don't want it to like not have prices on your stuff. And people just basically think like, oh, this is like a haggling yard sale situation where they can be like, how much is three? Will you take two? You do not want that. Like the price is the price. Make sure you have it priced out. I mean, if you're doing like cards, for instance, and you don't want to do like a sticker on the back of every single one, you could have them all in one section and it has like a very clear sign that says like cards, $5. But if you're spreading them out from that section, put a sticker on the back with the price because it'll make your life so much easier. It's it's going to be chaotic if people are asking you constantly how much does something cost and they're not as likely to buy if they have to ask you. <laughs> like people don't want to talk to you, okay? <laughs> they just want to know how much it is, <laughs> if they can afford it and they'll move on from there. So price everything, do that work now. It'll save you so much time there at the show um, as well. But it is going to be that upfront work. There's so much upfront work to craft fairs. That's what I'm trying to get at here. So you want to start early with pricing out everything for yourself. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like one of the closest experiences I have to a craft fair is, well, I did a pop-up shop in Madewell once. And there's some things that definitely can be carried over from that experience. But when I prepped for pinners, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is the only thing that I could think that would compare to this with just the amount of prep work, it was insane. And at the end, I was like, I never want to do that ever again. <laughs> yeah. And you got to package it all up and bring it and not have it damaged. And it's just, it's bananas. Like, yeah. it seems like, oh, just bring all my stuff. And then you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, yeah. Part lot. of it was definitely like the getting everything there was ridiculous it was like my car was filled to the brim with all of these art kits for these signs and everything and oh my goodness I had so many yeah I pretty much this is another little tip you guys I would get like those big plastic bins and just have every like I would have like five bins that had like one had all my display stuff in it one had all like the product in it and just like so I could easily just like pack up and like grab something and go like it was a lot easier than having like 500 different boxes so I just had like I don't know, like five or six big plastic tubs to put everything in. And it's waterproof if you are, you know, if you need a rain plant, you can just toss things in there as well. So that's a little mm-hmm. tip for you. Because <laughs> if you set yes. things on the ground and it's raining and it's in cardboard, guess what? Your cardboard box is ruined. <laughs> Yep. That's a very good tip. Love that. Practical life tip for markets. <laughs> Practical life tip for everybody. Yeah. I mean, this is how, okay, you guys, like, I am like a big fan of rubber bins because like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You call them bins or tubs. My family calls them bin, bins because uh, my family as- actually used to be nicknamed the bin family because when we would go on <laughs> our family vacations, my dad had a pickup truck and we all just had one bin and that was your bin. And you, we put it in the back of a pickup truck because they could get rained on. We didn't have suitcases and luggage. Like we all had a bin. <laughs> and mine what? was like decorated with stickers and it was closed with a bungee. And then when I would go to summer camp, I would take my bin. Like I just show up in my plastic bin or whatever. <laughs> And then everyone at summer camp started doing that because it just made sense because you could fit like your suitcase or like suitcase. I'm sorry, your sleeping bag and all this stuff in the bin. It was brilliant. And you could decorate right. it. I mean, it was just great. <laughs> Look at you, you little trendsetter. I know. Like, that's, all my, that's all my mom. The only thing when we like stopped at a, to stay at a hotel or something like on the way, we'd have to like bring all the bins in from the back of the truck. And it looked like, probably looked ridiculous because you I didn't want someone like steal them or something. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but, yeah, like, the right. Snack bin, the towel bin, you know, all this stuff. But. I love that they do. They all do Actually stack brilliant. so much easier. Yeah, they yeah. stack so much easier, and they can't get wet. I know, or they can get See? wet but not ruined. Right. So there you go. <laughs> there you go, guys. Plastic bins or plastic tubs. I don't know what I. I don't know what I call it, Cammy. I think bin makes the most yeah, sense. I call, I call them bins. Um, bin. But all of this leads us to the next point 
which is that you just have to set up and practice everything first, like all your displays, the flow of your booth, everything. You need to do it a couple times. (laughs) Yes. Like, don't think, oh, I'll just take all this stuff and I'll set it up when I get there. That is like, number one, you are going to (laughs) fail. Sorry, but you will. You want to set up everything before you go to the show. Just do like a little test run in your house. Even if you don't like have to set up your tent or anything, just set up the table and kind of like tape off the space so you know how much space you have to make sure you're not just like cramming stuff in there. Think about how you're going to display stuff on the table itself to have You want to maximize that vertical space. So having stuff hanging down from the top. So you have, you know, things at eye level, having things on risers. So they go, you know, above. It's not just all flat, like all flat laying on a table. It just doesn't look good. Like you want to have all different kinds of pieces interacting with different things. Um, And when I was doing these, I bought a ton of stuff at like Goodwill, thrift shops, just like little easels, just, you know, just gathering things Um, and then vintage dishes. And then when I would get to the show, I would put prices on those things too and just sell them. (laughs) Because people would ask and it's just one less thing to have to pack up unless you like really want to keep them. But something to think about. So that's like the best way to find displays. And then another little tidbit I was going to throw out for you guys is a really great display company, cleardisplays.com. They have amazing like greeting card displays that like come apart. They're like wooden and they, they come apart and really easy to pack away. So those are great for displaying greeting cards in a booth. They also have like spinners and stuff, but I wouldn't invest in that until you're like, Oh, yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> right, exactly. Unless you have a really, really good plan for getting some of that second hand and then maybe selling it again afterwards, that would be a good way to go about it. Because I feel like on Facebook Marketplace, you can find some really cute display things for less. Yeah. Actually, like, you know what? Even more practical tip, like make yourself a budget that you're like, you know what? I am willing to spend let's say $100 on display things. And as soon as I hit that, we're done. (laughs) That's a very good practical tip. That's not in my, that is not in my mind. (laughs) I would never have thought of that. We don't do that around here. We just go. Um, But I had this like picnic basket that I used for my display that I got at the Goodwill for like three bucks. And it was so great because I could put stuff inside of it and also like have it propped up like and lean stuff against it. Does that make sense? Like I could use Mm -hmm. a little table, lean stuff against it. And it was like, it was like, the greatest display piece ever. And it was so nice. And I would like keep stuff in there if I needed to grab things like extra product or whatever. Always good to have extra product when something sells, you can kind of replace it. So that's another thing to think about with inventory is if I sold everything in here or like a bunch of this stuff, could I replace it and still have my booth looking full? Because you do want your booth to look full, but you don't want it to look cluttered. So there's definitely a fine balance there. So having some stuff kind of stashed away is a good idea. That's where those bins come in handy, you guys. Okay. <laughs> the bins. <laughs> the bins. And then when you're setting up the flow of your booth, think about where you're going to be, um, where you can like take payment. Um, if it's in the very back of your booth, is it going to like create like a backflow where people can't get in? Like think about just the flow of everything. Like it really depends on that. And kind of think about having different sections within your booth as well. So maybe you're grouping by like, oh, here's a little holiday section. Here's like, this is how I kind of did it. I had like a holiday section. I had like an art print section. I had like my animal ABCs and I had this chalkboard above it that I wrote animal ABCs. It was a really cute chalkboard. It had like ABC letters on it. It was like vintage and like a little rack with all those. And then I'd have cards and then other little gifts. Like, you know, it just think about how to group things where they're going to work together. Maybe it's by color. Maybe it's like gifts for plant lovers or just product category. Just think about groupings and not so much just smattered all over the place. Mm-hmm. Yep. Definitely agree because you want people to be able to easily find things and yes. you want to be able to find things too if a customer is asking about something. Exactly. And that's speaking of finding things that brings us to our next point about signage. It's great to have lots of signage in your booth where people can read about, you know, maybe just like what you offer, what this is. Also, if you offer custom things, this is a great way to like get some advertising for that. Having a sign about your invitations or your pet portraits or house portraits or whatever, maybe even having an iPad slideshow underneath it that shows some of your past work since you can't bring every single thing or like a flip through like a, like a cute little scrapbook or photo album of different things. I did this for pet portraits. <laughs> this was one of the shows I did was a two day show and people kept asking about pet portraits. And that night I was like, I should make a pet portrait sign. So I like put together a sign for the next day that I could hang up and have people like sign up about pet portraits or they could purchase it on the spot and they got like a 10% discount or something. And I would take care of it. And I think I sold like three pet portraits and then had a couple people come back and purchase pet portraits. And all I did was make that sign. I was like, I need to make a sign <laughs> because people don't know to ask you that if you don't have some sort of signage showing what you offer. 
And I also had a, a little small section where I put a wedding invitation flip through so people could see the examples of stuff I had done. They weren't good then, but <laughs> they you know could what? at least see it. <laughs> I just had an idea because I was going to say that part of the strategy of doing something in person is figuring out how you can turn that into revenue later, even after it's over. And a- sure. already you've brought up some like great points of how you can do that, right? I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're kind of like outside the <laughs> before section, but that's okay, you guys. I'm just going to go so with much, it. All this, everything kind of falls into before. <laughs> like after like- you just get there and hope for the best. You know? <laughs> but I was going to say for somebody who like, maybe you're not super product heavy, but maybe your bread and butter is doing pet portraits, you could still sign up for a fair and you could like, like, take a couple portraits that you're painting in person. You know how curious mm-hmm. that makes people, like, oh, painting that's in like, public? That's one right? of my tips, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all well, about it. And then you can be like, well, you could put down your name here, and I'll follow up with you for the information. And maybe your only goal for paying $300 to go to this craft fair is to book, like, 10 pet portraits for $300 and each, and there's yes. your 3000 That is something I genuinely considered because there's this thing in Orlando called, like, Paul's in the Park. And I was like, Alex, if I just came here with a table and my easel and just started painting something and then just sold pet portraits, I would make bank here. I would make bank. I could like book out my calendar for the next year. I know I could. <laughs> like I yep. know it. So I do think there's like definitely something to be said for that. And it's a lot easier. You don't have to bring as much stuff. So just something to consider. <laughs> yeah. Some guerrilla marketing tactics I know. from an artist perspective. <laughs> Um, okay, so you were on the signage tip, I feel like. So do we want to bounce into payments next? Preparing for payments? Yes. You need to know how you're going to take payments. Okay, don't wait till the last minute to think about this because you might need to order some sort of card reader or something like that. Now, I think everyone has like Venmo and Apple Pay and all that shenanigans that's like I don't even know how to use at this point. But back in the day, it was just you had that little square reader, okay? And being able to like quickly add up the total, (laughs) like what's going to be easiest for you. So think about that. You know, is your phone going to have battery? You need to have a charger, you know, backup chargers. If you're taking payments through your phone, you know, you need a calculator separate so you can easily like charge them on Venmo or something. Or is it like an actual like calculator payment app like Square where you can say, here's a greeting card. Here's this. Like there's a lot of things to think about with that. I used Square before and I wasn't able to like keep track of which card was selling. I just had like a card is $5, a print is this much, this is this much, and would just add it. But I didn't put like, this is what card sold. And I would I would write down like what I sold or what I took so you could like subtract it from your inventory later. Another tip for, for you there. But I feel like we're going to get in the weeds a lot. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> just thinking about how to um, take those payments. And if you are going to take cash, I would have some sort of cash box on hand and some way, some change so you can like break larger bills and things like that. And you would have to be, you would have to be ready to calculate sales tax too, right? Yes. For cash, yes. yes. Or you could also, I've seen some makers just like raise their prices slightly at markets just to like cover in the sales tax kind of thing. So that's definitely a doozy. But if you're using something like Square, it would automatically calculate those things for you. So I highly recommend doing something along those lines. Yeah, exactly. I lean tech every time anymore. I feel like most people are prepared with their cards and very few people are like begging for the opportunity to pay in cash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So just thinking So you about could that. always say like, I can accept your cash, but I don't have change. Like you could go about that if you really want to, wanted to, right? Like if someone was begging. Yeah. You just want to make it like very seamless and easy to check out because I promise you like the first customer that comes through, you're going to be so excited and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, how do I do do my things? Like just make sure you like feel very confident (laughs) when you're doing those things. Um, That definitely makes a difference and shows professionalism. So practice. Yeah, I was going to say practice that too. Exactly. Like practice with your spouse, with your mom, with a friend, with whoever can help you. Practice if someone comes up with you and has like a bunch of random stuff in their hands, okay? <laughs> like practice that. And make sure you have like some sort of table to set it on so you're not just like fumbling around. Like think about those things that are going to that's going to make your life easier. Mhm. Agreed. Okay, so last tip 
that you have listed under before, which obviously we've crossed the line a little bit on some of the things. (laughs) The last thing Cammie wrote is tablecloths and a chair. So place to sit. So you want to bring some kind of little stool or something to sit so you're not just standing all day. Um, And then the tablecloth is so you can hide your bins that you brought all your stuff in. You can easily just throw things under there, um, have that ready to go. And then I also, this is, I, we have, I didn't write this down, but thinking about the before as well, obviously you're going to need some sort of tent. Some shows require a white tent. So I wouldn't get crazy and like decide to just go buy like a hot pink one because some shows like are like, we only do white tents. So something to keep in mind. And I would highly recommend getting one that has the sides because then you can separate from the other booths around you. If it's like, I don't know, I was next to like a wind chime booth <laughs> one time and it was really nice to have the sides and it just looks a lot cleaner. And if it rains, you can just like zip up all the sides and have all your stuff protected. Yes, that's a great idea of having the separation because nothing feels more awkward than having your booths really close to other people. Yeah, I mean, you're next, right next to someone typically. <laughs> right, and you're like trying to kind of keep your own space and then you can avoid any awkward conversations or Locks what have you. From you can hide. Car. You can hide a little bit. It's just, it's just, it just looks a lot cleaner. So <laughs> get the sides. <laughs> oh. I'm You'll, sorry. I'm just yes. laughing about me saying you can hide and you just like reiterated it so calmly. Like, yeah, you can hide. Like, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. You can hide in there all day. But if you're hiding, what are you doing at the craft show? Because I'm about to tell you what you need to be doing during and it is not hiding, Elizabeth. I He's know. Okay. That's why a craft show would not be the right fit for me, y'all. All right. We're ready. We're officially moving into the during stage of the craft right. show. So since we're not hiding, like Elizabeth mentioned, but she was <laughs> incredibly wrong. You really, you actually have to sell. Like a craft show is not a passive situation, okay? You have to be an active participant if you want to be successful at a craft show. It is awkward for everyone if you don't say a peep if someone is in your booth, okay? It's awkward for them. It's awkward for you. Everyone feels awkward. When you feel awkward, you're not going to spend money, okay? So have a line or two ready to go. Make them feel welcome. Say hello. Say hello to people walking by. That is how I got people to stop in all the time. Be like, how are you doing? Oh, my God. Like, just compliment their shoes, anything, just to get their attention. I promise you they're going to feel so awkward that you're talking to them and they didn't stop in. They're just going to stop in out of pity's sake, and then they'll buy something. (laughs) (laughs) So you are your best asset at this craft show. Be chatty. Be open. Like, People want, it's exciting to like get to meet people and talk to them, have conversations. Like people do want to talk to you and meet the maker and you have a story to share. And it's just going to be amazing if you can, you know, just really be an extrovert that day (laughs) and be ready to educate too, because people are going to ask you why you price the way you do, how, what's your process like? How did you get started as an artist? And just have like some of those answers prepared, like your little FAQ, if you will, in the back of your head. So you can be ready to answer those things for people. Mm-hmm. Yep. I know. I ugh, it's just so awkward. <laughs> <laughs> this is like where I shine. Like I I like hey in the gallery, like Papa G, like when me and Papa go in, in his art gallery and be in there and painting during the day, we would be able to sell the crap out of stuff because we just like play off each other with jokes and laughing with our customers and it's just it's just so much fun. Like I always just enjoyed that. And that's something I definitely learned from Pop was just like how to interact with customers and and make them laugh. And uh, I don't know, it's just fun. Like I, I, that's like the most, most fun part of it for me, even though I'm a total introvert. I just like love meeting people at craft fairs <laughs> or See, in my shop now. You, like I love it. <laughs> I feel like you have the magic combination. If you're really good at the before prep and really good at the during, because I feel like I am amazing at prepping for things before, but the during part of it, man, I have to be like in the right, the right mindset, which I guess is a good tip for people. Like if you are more like me, where it takes you a second to get like a little warmed up to talk to people is it bad to say that you should take some liquid courage (laughs) that is up to you (laughs) because honestly i would probably just take a quick shot in my car right beforehand and that would like loosen me up just enough to feel a little more comfortable and not awkward okay like you're not i I feel like a performer i'm like this is my stage i'm gonna (laughs) shine right now i don't even know what's coming i'm about to brighten their whole day (laughs) oh Oh my so it's goodness. good to have a few dumb jokes that gets them every time. <laughs> yes. I, I 
his jokes are definitely good but yeah yeah and I, look I, I think, you guys like match your brand vibe like that'll give you some confidence too i mean yeah seriously. i totally agree <laughs> like if you get all dolled up then you you definitely will feel more confident i can mm-hmm. attest to that for sure yeah. I don't know. I get I get in the mood sometimes where I'm like really, really good and I don't have a problem. The thing is, I don't have a problem like public speaking. I just don't like public interacting. <laughs> so <laughs> like talking to people one on one afterwards. But anyhow. OK, so on to the next thing, keeping your customers happy and excited and not feeling awkward. You also need to keep your booth organized and make sure you're efficient with checkout to keep people moving through. And have bags. That wasn't in our before prep, was it? It wasn't in our before prep, okay. but it should be. I was just like, I need some <laughs> other things in during. I'll just put this on here, but it's kind of um, – it could be a before, but have I some I love bags. that. It's in all caps, too. That's how you know that Cami <laughs> thought of it last minute. Have yes. bags, all I mean, caps. <laughs> You don't have to have them, but again, professionalism, convenience. If they want to buy a bunch of stuff, they're like, oh, I don't want to carry this around all day. But you're like, but look, I have a bag. Then they're like, oh, okay. Because what they'll do is they'll say, oh, I'll just come back to grab it before I leave. And then they won't. So get the bags. It's going to be an upfront cost, but you can use them again if you don't. You know, I have bags that I bought for my first crap show that I'm still using in my shop now. (laughs) So, (laughs) but those people who needed them, needed them. And it was very well worth it. Put a sticker on it, make it cute. Definitely well worth it to have those. Put them in your bin. And Cammie said sticker, not stick, just so you know. (laughs) For some reason, it sounded like put a stick on it. Put a stick on it. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, uh, (laughs) sticker. No, we're good. You just get so excited. I get so excited, And I'm sure other people... Other people can deduce what you meant. I just thought it was funny. You guys know me by now. I can barely even talk. It's fine. I don't know how we have a podcast because I like cannot speak. <laughs> <laughs> like Instagram trying to do my captions. It's always hilarious. Um. <laughs> um, okay. So your next tip is to make friends with the other makers. Okay. This directly goes against the whole tent with the sides thing, though. What? You can still I'm make kidding. friends with I'm the sides. <laughs> I mean, it's always fun to meet the makers around you. Like, especially if you're there alone and you need someone to watch your booth, then you want to ask Susie next door selling wind chimes if you can watch your booth for a hot second while you go pee. I would also recommend bringing a friend or a significant other because it's nice to have that. But yeah. you want to at least, you know, say hello to the person next to your neighbors and meet them, <laughs> especially if you're going to be there for a couple days. It's just nice to say hello and they can you can send them to each other's booths and be like, oh, make sure you check out so and so down the way or whatever. It's just nice to mm-hmm. do a little outreach there, make some friends. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't absolutely. have to. That's just a little bonus. That's not like a mandatory thing. <laughs> no, I think. No, I think it is. I think that's important, though. If you are going to like utilize the whole experience to your benefit, I would say that's one of the things that you want to be doing yeah. and exchanging business cards and all that stuff, because you might be able to oh, send yeah. someone their that's way in the thing. future. Bring business, business cards. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, I think I forgot about something in the before that we didn't go over. It's in the notes. Okay. It is in the notes um, about audience capture. So even if people are coming through um, and they're not buying things, you can do a QR code, email sign up, some sort of incentive to get them to do that. Say like, oh, I, like I did I'm uh, doing a drawing for um, if you enter your name here, you want to somebody's going to win a $50 shop credit or something. And so people would sign up to win $50 shop credit. And I just had like a little note power. They would write it and then I would add it to my email list later. Um, But now you could be way more techie with it and have an iPad or a QR code. But I had mine like on my palette with like a really cute notepad on my easel. So it definitely was like a cute thing to draw people in, like win $50, (laughs) like right at the front of my booth. So that's that's kind of how I did it. But I would definitely have some sort of way to capture your audience. And if they're like, I want to hear from you. Be like, well, sign up for my email list right here. Plus, you get a chance to win a $50 shop credit and go on a little shopping spree. The end. <laughs> yep, there we go. And that is part of, yeah, that's part of the prep and kind of part of during. So it actually yeah. worked out because I feel like it's okay, like perfect. during the fair that you're kind of pushing people like, hey, do this. You just want to make sure you prep to have that. I love that and idea of the QR code. Another way of talking to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like the QR code idea because if you have a bunch of people mingling around, then you don't have a line for the email list, which is really inconvenient. And then you could just be like, hey, just scan the QR code and put your name on the list and everyone's using their own device w- rather than waiting for one thing. But you have to decide yeah. because Cami said 
it, what Cami said is true. Like I could draw people in of like, oh, what is this? Oh, I can put my name on the notepad. You know, some people yeah. might like that. Maybe both. <laughs> Do both. Like I would have, maybe you could have a QR code. Maybe you could have the sign up as well. I mean, either one, like people can choose. Like some people it's easier to, you know, write down their email real quick. Like I'd prefer to write mine down than do a QR code, but that's just me. <laughs> so yeah. And I'm going to choose QR code every time. Yeah. So I think choices are good. Choices everybody. Are good. Yeah. That's definitely an option there too. So maybe put the QR code, you can print it out and put it all around your booth, like on the little table and stuff too. That's another way of like just reiterating that. So, um, okay. Where are we here? During uh, oh, that you actually have to sell stuff. Oh yeah, that's that's yeah, you have to sell about chit chatting and stuff. Oh, the have a rain plan. I talked about this before. Having a tent with sides, you know, good divider. But have it do have a rain plan because I promised you like there's going to be a storm. There's always a storm. Like every single one I've done, there has been some sort of storm that has come through. I've had to like close down everything or you know bring stuff inside. So have some sort of rain plan you might need to hold down your booth. Okay. You might need to hold down the tent. If it's a huge gust of wind, like I've seen people's tents literally get blown away. So I would have some sort of weights on your tent. Alex would literally drill the tent into the asphalt with some sort of concrete drill. And it was definitely not allowed, but we did that anyway. So, like, Oh boy. <laughs> I yeah. would say like we drilled into the streets of Orlando. <laughs> like, sandbags or weights could also work. If that, you don't want to drill into the concrete. Yeah, my husband was just like, this tent is not moving. We are not having that problem. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, but I did have a problem with like water buildup one time, like creating like a little pool on the top of the tent. And I had, we had to like keep hitting it to get the water out. And, and then if you leave stuff overnight, there's always like dew and stuff. So the tent with sides, just have some sort of plan if it starts raining. So you're not like, holy moly, all my stuff's blown away. And I did like such cute sidewalk um, chalk. Like I did like chalk in front of my booth. Oh, that was like, that's a really good tip, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did like this huge chalk like thing that said welcome like right in front of my booth like really pretty and it looked awesome until it rained and it wasn't there the next day and I was like I can't do that again but it definitely like got people's attention <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah what did it and sorry did you already say what it said yeah it said welcome and it had like an arrow and it was like in pretty calligraphy and stuff like drawing yeah it was just like a huge welcome on the street in front of my booth and welcome 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 um so another fun fun little tip because what your booth looks like is just really gonna matter like to draw people in like they're you know it's like having a little store it's fun so you want to make it enticing like that really is what's going to make or break you is getting people in it's either your sparkling personality or sparkling booth so why not have both (laughs) (laughs) you that's so funny Um. (laughs) or yeah exactly porque Mm. no los dos uh, I know both? that's okay. So when I was by the the wind chime lady, it actually was great because her booth like made a ton of noise and everyone was like, "What is that?" and would always walk to go see what it was. So honestly, it worked out great. So maybe get a wind chime. <laughs> yeah, get a wind chime and hang that on your tent. Love yeah. that. And then have it for sale. Put a price tag on it too. <laughs> <laughs> Put a price tag on your tent while you're at it. Might as well. <laughs> Who needs an Wait. Upgrade? So what did you do with your tent once I still you were have done? It. No, I still have it. We use it all the time. We use it um, when we go to like the track and stuff. We used it when I was there for the sip and shop. Oh, yeah. We use it at the sip and shop. And then Julianne just just borrowed it. Yeah, it's my same tent. And Julianne just borrowed it for her. She did a craft show and she's got another one coming up. So she's going to borrow the tent again. So it's been well loved. (laughs) It has definitely been well loved. Um, And the last tip for during you already talked about, you touched on a little bit earlier, but bringing a friend or a significant other, which I still think is important enough to definitely mention again. Otherwise, that's just a lot of time to be on your own. Yeah. And at least have them come for like lunch so you can actually have a proper meal and bring water. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. yes, I need those breaks. Um, Okay. So now you've done a very successful craft show. You've sold out like half your inventory. You made some money. Everything's great. You packaged everything up. Oh, that's always a doozy too. Just packing everything away with your bins. Uh, Let's talk about the after. Elizabeth will shine on this um, because... She will be super great at following up with customers that you captured while they still remember you. (laughs) So send that follow-up email, maybe that discount code, send whoever won their $50 thing if that's what you did. Just make sure to follow up with them sooner rather than later while they're still, they still remember you. Here, yeah, I have another pro tip actually that I'm going to go ahead and interject because the point of doing as much prep work before as you can is so that you are making it easier on yourself later. And one of the things I would do is 
write your welcome sequence in your email system before the craft fair even happens because good idea. Yeah. there is nothing like a killjoy than getting home and being like, I have all these customers and ugh, now I have to write like the three emails they're going to get over the next week to, you know, try to get them engaged with my brand. That sounds terrible. <laughs> but what sounds really fun is being able to upload them to your email platform, tag them and have them put into an automation and it just happens. That sounds amazing. So that is what I would do. Write the email sequence before and then after you just plug them all in and it's and it goes. And it goes. Yes, exactly. Oh, I also forgot to mention something during the during, but I feel like this is like self-explanatory, but obviously be sharing a ton of this on your stories and social media because you never know who of your followers is local and wants to come out and support you. So moving on. (laughs) Moving on. Yes, social media, very important. Yes. Okay, so after if uh, go over what sold versus what didn't. So this is kind of the time to look at your products and be like, well, I still have a ton of this left. Like maybe it wasn't the right audience. Maybe it was priced too high. Maybe it's just a sucky product. Just kidding. None of you guys have that. Um, But looking at those things, what sold, what didn't, like maybe you can lean into what was really selling for you. Like maybe people were like really stoked on your notepads. You're like, hmm, maybe I have something here. So looking at what sold versus what didn't. Also, if you were keeping up with inventory during the show, you can like go ahead and start like figuring all that out, subtracting from the inventory you had. There's a ton of different ways to do this. And I don't want to get in the weeds of inventory stuff, but just going over all that, did any product get damaged that you need to throw away that needs to be subtracted from your inventory? So just going over all of that stuff, um, as well as going over all your expenses um, from the show. Like I would count your lunch into that expense, like what the cost of the show versus the money you made. So you can see how much profit you actually made from the show at the end of the day. So all the stuff you spent on getting your tent, your tables, all that stuff, which can be used again and again, once you purchased it, but if it's your first show, um, that's going to go into like your expenses as well. So just to figure out how much profit you actually made. Yep. Having a little spreadsheet never hurts. I would definitely be (laughs) spreadsheeting it up if it was me. (laughs) Um, Like specific, I used to do that for my calligraphy workshops, which was really helpful because then I had a breakdown for that event specifically to be able to see everything. So, so yeah. Okay. Do we have any other ones left? A couple things. Yeah. And then when you're going after the show as well, after you take a big long rest, because you're literally exhausted, trust me, (laughs) see where you can improve in the future. Like we talked about the product, what sold versus what didn't, but were there any like sticky spots in your process where you're like, oh crap, I kept getting hung up on the checkout because of this thing or whatever. Maybe one product didn't sell at all. And you're like, "Hmm, I need to revisit that. Was there something that people kept picking up and looking at at looking at the price and then not buying it. Like maybe the pricing is off. Did you have feedback from customers that could lead to new products or improving current ones? Like what was the audience reaction like? What were they really resonating with? Just like being really introspective and taking notes of all these things. Like there is so much valuable information that you're not going to get from selling online that you can get in person if you are open to being perceptive to those things. So that's like one of the big takeaways from craft fairs is that it's like a huge experiment to see how people actually interact with your products. And if you take the time to really delve into that, um, it could turn into, you know, some greater things for you in the future. Yeah, I was going to say, and maybe another pro tip is just have a little notepad by your checkout area in your booth. So in your downtime, you can be making some of those notes as you go, because there might be little nuances and small moments that you don't remember after, but will be very important for you to come back and review later on so that you can make those changes. Yes, for sure. So all those little things, um, there really is like, even if you made negative dollars at a craft show, there, no craft show is ever a failure. It's really not because you do get all those like little nuancey things and so much learning. And there's so much to be gained from witnessing those in-person interaction with your products and that exposure to a whole new audience who never even heard of you before. So at least you've got put yourself out there, met some new people, got a couple people in your email list. That is awesome. They're going to talk to their friends about it, their family. So there's just a lot of like networking that can come from it with people who are actually, you know, not just fellow makers that you meet, but people who could be buyers for you. And for me, um, from craft shows, I found it really easy to see spots where I was like missing stuff in my product line. Like people will be like, oh, well, you have this, but do you have this that goes with it? I was like, no, (laughs) but I could, you know, like it just helped me, (laughs) helped me kind of. I don't know, just narrow my focus and started seeing the things that I, I really loved and really resonated with people. And and also, you guys, <laughs> this is a random story, <laughs> but I just remember- I'm ready. I'm excited. Uh, the, uh, oh, I just remembered another craft show I did. I totally forgot about. But um, 
Wow, so random. <gasps> you guys, what am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> this lady you're good come back to up, <laughs> this lady picked up the hedgehog and she the hedgehog painting she's like oh look at this porcupine he's so cute and i just i just there was just so many people who like missed like labeled my animals and i was just like what is going on i just remember her calling the hedgehog a porcupine this lady was like super drunk because it was like a night event and it was oh, alex and i were like <laughs> cracking up and she was and I was one time I was explaining that my animal ABCs were like, oh, the E is for elephant. And she was like, oh, the elephant, it's in the shape of an M. I get it. And I was like, no, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. It was like, there's just so many. <laughs> funny things it makes for some like, great yes. people watching. That's for sure. That's the mentality I would have to go and to it with i will say after all of this i'm like oh you know what i feel a little better like maybe i could do a craft fair don't know what i would do it with but i could do a craft fair and maybe just coming from a, the approach of like this is some really good people watching it and it's going to be entertaining it is rather it's than coming from my like social anxiety like don't talk to me <laughs> <laughs> perspective yeah, it, you just never know you never know what kind of opportunities are going to arise too because one of the ones i did that's how i connected with paper goat post i met cedar there and i was like oh my gosh paper goat post is here i would love to have my products in their stores and i was like I remember being like so courageous and like walking up to him and i was like hello i'm an artist i'd love you could come check out my booth and like now obviously they're friends and like it wouldn't be <laughs> but i was like so nervous and that's how i met them and got like one of my first wholesale accounts and i was just so excited and that was like a really cool really cool moment for me that was a great craft Aww. show because it was like some sort of event and they had like free food and I just kept sending Alex to get plates and it was awesome. <laughs> so you've done like you have done quite a few then. Maybe I know I realize. literally forgot about that one. That one was an indoor one. I don't and when it was like fancy, that was where the drunk girl was. Um because it was like drinks and dinner and it was in the Orlando Science Center. It was really cool. <laughs> it was like through Yelp or something, like a Yelp event. Cammy. Uh oh. Um you guys, I think we lost Cammy. <laughs> All right, y'all. For some reason, Cammy's internet cut out at the very end there, and we're not entirely sure what happened or why it happened. But I'm very glad that we did get through all of the points that we wanted to tell you guys. So that being said, a little bit of housekeeping. If you would like to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, we always appreciate that. Let us know what you love about the podcast. It really encourages us and it helps other people find it too. Make sure you take a screenshot of wherever you're listening. Share it on Instagram stories and tag us. We would absolutely love to hear from you. Last but not least, we still do our Q and Cake episodes every fifth episode, which means we're answering your questions on the podcast. So head over to bizbirthdaybash.com slash Q and Cake to submit any questions that you have. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Hey guys, we just wanted to hop in and talk about one of our amazing resources, the A to Z directory. All of us have thought at some point, how did she do that or how did she make that? And maybe you don't know where to start or how the heck to produce this amazing product you've dreamt up. Well, the A to Z directory is the missing puzzle piece in your biz, you guys, seriously. So it's built in the form of a yearly membership and it's your one-stop shop for finding suppliers and vendors for all the things. Literally where to print everything from custom invitations, greeting cards, mugs, koozies, acrylic printing, letterpress, custom ribbon. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And it literally goes from A to Z. From acrylic printers to zipper pouches, we have it in the A to Z directory. We want to help all of you search less and create more with this list of 300 plus vendors and suppliers. Don't worry, they're very organized. It's not going to be overwhelming and confusing when you join. And this membership also includes access to a private Facebook community. It's incredibly active and involved. And if you need a question answered fast, that is definitely the place to go. Yeah, our Facebook group really is the best. You guys, everyone is so helpful in there, and we're in there too, um, answering questions you guys might have. So it's a great way to get access to us and ask us things without sliding into our DMs. So we're more likely to answer you in the Facebook group, just saying. Anyway, <laughs> also in the Facebook group, this is new for 2020, and we're really excited about it. We are hosting monthly power hour Q&A sessions that are live, and these are only available to our A to Z directory members. So you can hop in with us live and ask us all your burning questions in real time and just hang out with us every month. And we do these at different times so you can actually be there live and the replays are always available in the Facebook group for members. 
This resource is priced at $147 a year, which honestly is extremely affordable and it's full of so many benefits, such as exclusive vendor coupons for members only. And we would love to have you guys join. Seriously, it's kind of like our family and our tribe. So visit bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash directory to sign up today and use coupon code podcast2020 to receive $20 off your first year. That's podcast, all caps, 2020 for $20 off your first year. We can't wait to see you in the Facebook group.